If you ask most people about Cold War era Berlin, eventually Checkpoint Charlie will come up. The border crossing checkpoint, where West Berlin became East Berlin, where communism met capitalism, is seared into the cultural memory of the Cold War and is one of the most visited tourist spots in Berlin today. But this wasn't the only checkpoint between the two Berlins, indeed the two Germanys. Yet it is the most famous and has been ever since the United States and the Soviet Union pointed tanks at each other in October of 1961. And these tanks were pointed at each other after a year in which war War seemed inevitable. So inevitable that the President of the United States, unknown to the public at the time, had approved plans for full-scale nuclear war in case the United States lost access to Berlin. In the years since the tank standoff, American accounts would claim this as a unquestioned American victory, and as the moment that the West lost Berlin. All the while not fully appreciating how close this incident was to turning the Cold War irrevocably hot because a diplomat wanted to take his wife on a date. So how did we get there? To understand why this incident almost completely spun out of control, we need to go to the end of World War II. Specifically, we need to go to Potsdam in 1945, an agreement signed between Joe, Harry, and Clement. The Potsdam Agreement, which affirmed that Germany was to be split between the victors, affirmed early agreements on how Berlin was to be governed while they figured out what a peace treaty looked like. Most importantly, this agreement, not a treaty, gave each signatory rights until a final peace settlement could be made. Nine checkpoints to facilitate travel were established between the western zones and the eastern zones, as the agreements gave all four powers rights of access to the other zones, and this is where things go downhill quick. The West never negotiated a right of access to their Berlin zones, which were inside of the greater Soviet zone of control. They assumed it would be provided based on the implications of the Potsdam Agreement and other already pre-existing agreements. And because the Soviet Union basically was already allowing it. It was a stupid mistake. They were given three air corridors by the Soviets, but... This is effectively where the Berlin airlift came from. Very long story short, the West showcased they maintain a right of access to their zones as per Potsdam. But this right of access was a massive issue for the Soviet Union and then East Germany. People could simply leave. And one of the most important lessons of the Berlin airlift was that the West needed to maintain this right of access to their zones, as well as the inability to trust that the Soviet Union would provide them that access. But how could that be done without an actual treaty? One way which is very pertinent to this story is the threat of a military. There's a very good reason East Germany was able to maintain the fig leaf that the wall was designed to keep people out. The threat was there. Another way is by building a norm that there is a right of access. For example, bilateral treaties where military attaches, spies, were allowed close to free reign to wander through the other zones of control. And this is all great, but eventually the Soviet Union and East Germany got kind of tired of allowing the West to maintain this foothold in the so-called Iron Curtain. As mentioned, there wasn't a hard border. People could simply leave. It was time to hand the foothold back. By 1961, the Soviet Union and East Germany had enough. The status of Berlin needed to be sorted. The Soviet Union saw an acceptable range of options that went from Berlin being left to them, to everybody pulls out and we name all of Berlin a free city, basically. After the West basically went absolutely not, Khrushchev issued an ultimatum. If the final peace settlement wasn't reached by the end of the year, he would unilaterally make one with East Germany and let the chips fall as they may. He would give East Germany full control over who had access to Berlin. As this is going on, East Germany is also pressuring the Soviet Union in the background. Either the Soviet Union started providing workers to East Germany, or let them build a wall so people would stop leaving. Khrushchev hadn't wanted to build a wall. He saw the very idea of it as a contradiction of Soviet values. It would also potentially hamper what he saw as having the upper hand in Berlin negotiations. The Berlin airlift, after all, had been an embarrassment to the Soviet Union. But out of options and publicly pressured by East German leader Walter Ulbricht, the Berlin Wall is erected in August, and the response of the United States is kind of meh. From the benefit of the future, we are able to see that the actions taken by the United States aligned more with making sure they kept access to West Berlin and that the terms of the Potsdam Agreement were abided by. Kennedy had, in fact, previously that year implied he was okay with a permanent division of Berlin. So despite saber-rattling and largely symbolic shows of force, the United States takes a largely wait-and-see approach, one of which was coming up with a military plan and just what to do if the Soviet Union cut off access to Berlin. Once again, this all goes back to the Potsdam Agreement. In response to this wait-and-see approach, however, Khrushchev sees the Soviet Union as being on the front foot. He can keep pressuring the United States. Now is not the time to cool a Cold War off, especially with what he views as the United States being wishy-washy on areas of disarmament. On 17 October, Khrushchev announced the Soviet Union would be testing what became known as Tsar Bama, and also announced he was pulling back his deadline on Berlin. The priorities in the Cold War seemingly were shifting. And then 22 October 1961 happened. 
On 22 October 1961, the assistant U.S. mission chief to Berlin was detained by East German border guards attempting to cross the border. He was on his way to a theater performance in East Berlin with his wife on a date. Could you imagine going on a date and almost ending the world? The Americans responded by literally marching infantry into East Berlin to demonstrate their free right of access. They then began a series of exercises of using tanks to escort civilian vehicles into East Berlin. Remember, all actual action and policy taken by the United States comes back around to maintaining that right of access. According to a telegram from the mission at Berlin to the Department of State in a meeting with the Soviet Commandant in Berlin, he stated what the East German guards had done was nothing wrong. The West did this to the Soviet Union without complaint and warned against the open provocation of continually marching troops into the Eastern sector. You can guess what the Americans did. And on October 27th, when the United States rolled their tanks up to the border, Soviet tanks appeared to greet them. They literally had been hiding around the corner on the grounds of the, at the time, former Crown Prince Palace. And thus a standoff began. Now, skipping ahead, obviously this didn't escalate. But something that has been guessed at for many years is why the United States, which two weeks previously had actually been discussing ways they could use an incident like this to push down the Berlin Wall, suddenly blinked and made de-escalation the order of the day. Originally, the consensus was that because the United States had provoked the Soviet Union into defending the border, they had gotten them to admit to two things. First, the border controls, and thus the Berlin Wall, were actually the fault of the Soviet Union, not East Germany as they claimed. And second, the Soviet Union actually wanted to keep the Potsdam Agreement in place. Otherwise, why would they object so strongly to a violation of its norms? It's a convincing argument, but, first, as the record has borne out, the Soviet Union didn't actually want to build the Berlin Wall. They were successfully maneuvered into doing so by East Germany. And second, there's the poodle blanket. As part of the situation escalating in Berlin, and with fear that the Soviet Union would cut off access to Berlin, the Kennedy administration came up with a plan on what to do in case that happened. Nicknamed the Poodle Blanket, and officially known as National Security Action Memorandum 109, it authorized a series of steps on how to regain control. These steps ended in general nuclear war. And they had been sent to the commander of NATO forces on October 20th, one week before tanks were pointed at each other. The exact scenario that began the escalation of steps. While those on the ground, especially Lucius Clay, gleefully wanted to take advantage of what they saw as a runaway train, those at the higher levels were doing everything they could to put the brakes back on that train. The United States communicated through back channels to the Soviet Union they would be pulling back if the Soviet Union pulled back. Khrushchev authorized the Soviet tanks to pull back first. He didn't want this confrontation in Berlin. His position was that he had only reacted to what he saw as American propaganda. The United States followed. The official position of the United States was that the point had been made. A wall, as Kennedy would say, was a lot better than a war. One he had authorized to happen if these tanks hadn't pulled back. American accounts would spin out of control over the years. Trumping this both as an unquestioned American win, and as the moment that the West lost Berlin. East Germany and the Soviet Union tended to gloss over the event, seeing it as nothing more than proof of American provocation, and thus proving the danger that the wall protected against. In his memoirs, Khrushchev, however, would acknowledge this as the moment that solidified in East and West Berlin. Kennedy would visit Checkpoint Charlie about a year later, and the mystique of it has never won away. But Kennedy and Khrushchev both seem to have acknowledged the same thing. Starting World War III over a guy taking his wife out on a date was a really silly idea. 